Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, it's Holy Spirit Sands, and what I'm going to say, it's springtime. <laughs> I don't know where you are in the world, but we woke up kind of to spring this week weekend here. Uh, it's sunny. It's the grass is turning green. Yay! And uh, the neighbor across the street, uh, the, he said, "How you doing, Ray?" Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful day. Right. And I said, yes, it is a beautiful day. That's right. And I said, Brad, I said, Brad, when are you going fishing? He said, as soon as, as, soon as it fishing season opens. opens up. I said, Brad, can I go fishing with you? And he said, yeah. <laughs> so isn't it a beautiful spring day when your neighbors are across the street and you say, you're having a great conversation and I says, Brad, can I go fishing with you as soon as it opens up? And he said, yes. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And it's two years since it's been an interesting day in the neighborhood to a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Right. And I just happen to have a scripture. Okay. Okay, well, in it. Genesis chapter 6, we can talk about, you know, Noah. We can talk about all the different issues in the days of Noah. You know, is this, are we in the days of Noah? I kind of think so. Seasons and times and that, are we in the days of Noah? And uh, in verse 8 it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, Oh, Oh, that we all, oh, 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 oh. That Noah, because he was, let's say, a, he loved to be in the presence of God. Mm-hmm. He was obedient to Abba. Mm-hmm. He was obedient. Yeah. He listened. Yeah. But he it says he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there's a there's a, a there's a a formula here oh. to find grace. Really. Yes, in the no. eyes of the Lord. Yeah, I'm just saying. God doesn't have formulas. Well, I'm just, I know, but I'm trying to find. <laughs> you, my lips are stuck here. But, <laughs> His um, grace. But in the days of Noah, everything was in a <laughs> kerfuffle. Well, in the world, true. it was yes. in a kerfuffle. And that's true. And, and it, was true. A, it was like. Uh, true of today, too. Well, there was balderdash happening everywhere. My goodness, balderdash over here, balderdash over there. Uh-huh. You know what balderdash is? That's a lot of balder dash. Sounds like a mess. mess. It's a mess. <laughs> so, Noah found grace. Yes. Mm-hmm. I thank the Lord that I can find grace yes. during all this balder dash. Amen. You know, there's all yeah. things happen around the world, and it's good to find grace and mercy in the eyes of the Lord. Even though everything else is not so good around you, the Lord is looking upon his beloved. The Lord is looking upon his sons and daughters. He's yeah. looking upon his bride. Mm-hmm. And he's finding, oh, People regardless find, of what's happening. We can all find that grace. Grace, mm-hmm. Noah and his family, the yeah. fam. Right. Are you part of the fam of God? Mm-hmm. If you're part of the fam of God, it says here that, but the fam of God found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I know I took Noah's name out, but I, it, it's his whole family that found grace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Why did they find grace? Well, <clears throat> prior to the garden, the father was in a walkabout. You know, he created the heavens and the earth. You can read all that. And when he created, he said, Ah, oh, day and night, ah, oh, that is good. That is good. Mm-hmm. You know? So he every time he created something, he said, that is good. When he created, uh, I like the way Brock put it last week. I'm going to leave that alone. You know, God had to rest on the. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Boy, I created man and woman. Well, that was William, yeah. Or was it William? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. he says, oh, i got to rest now on the seventh day. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know what's going to happen. No, God, God was in a walkabout. <laughs> And the world was, prior to the garden, would have been occupied by a lot of different things that weren't so good. But God still walked on this earth because he was not a visitor. He created it. 
It was his land. Mm -hmm. It continues to be his land right. and always will be his land, his earth. And he made Adam out of his land, his earth. Right. And, Noah, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Regardless of the turmoil, there was turmoil in the garden. There was turmoil during the time of Noah. There was turmoil prior to the Passover. The father heard the cries of his children, let my people go. And he sent his servant Moses to go and be his messenger to let his people go. Who is God calling now to the people of this land, to the people of his land, to let his people go? And are you being called in a time as such as this, in Noah's time? Are you going to be in that same place saying, I'm finding the grace and the mercy of God, and God wants me to take the grace and mercy to those that he loves? Amen. Amen. You know, prior to next week, which is the Passover, the Father, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, there were, there were demigods that were on this land. And they were all defeated prior to the Passover. Each one. Even the god Ra, the sun god. You can go read it. I'm not going to teach about it. You can go read it. The sun god... Uh, was the big God, but God even, did, Abba Father even defeated him. There's nothing in this earth that is his land that he hasn't already defeated. Mm -hmm. And the blood of his land, the blood of the son, of his son hasn't already defeated. And the Holy Spirit and the promise that's within us can defeat all things. Can defeat all things in Christ Jesus. By the power and the authority that we walk in. So Genesis chapter 6 verse 17 it says, And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth. It says to, and it says, to destroy from heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. I will establish my covenant with you. He's talking about Noah mm -hmm. and his fan. The fan. I'm going to establish my covenant with you. <laughs> and you shall go into my ark, my place of safety, mm -hmm. of where I am going to dwell with you during this time. Whatever the difficulty is, the Father is saying, I'm going to come and dwell with you during this time. Yeah. Because the promise of God is within you. And the blood of Jesus is over you. And his presence is on. I'm going to dwell with you during these times of difficulty. Of balderdash, whatever it is in the world. Because I bring you boldness to come against the balderdash. Rumors of war and wars. Yeah, you know, things are happening in Iran. Things are happening in Israel. It is going to get continued. Do not get upset about what's happening in the world. It's his land. He went on a walkabout before. We're in a time that Brock's going to be te teaching about later, that Jesus was in a walkabout during the resurrection and the life for 40 days. What a walkabout. Mm -hmm. But can I just go back to 17? And it says, Behold, I myself will bring flood waters. I thank you, Lord, to bring the waters of heaven, the streams of living water from heaven mm -hmm. and below the earth upon us, so that the living water, Jesus... John chapter 7, 37 to 39. I am, the, I am the living water. Drink of me and you shall never thirst again. I believe, I believe that this is such, not only a warning, but a declaration and a proclamation. For those, yes, you're going to drown in the water if you don't know who the Lord Jesus Christ is as a personal Savior. But if you do and you're part of the family, you'll be able to breathe under the water because the living water is everything that we are in Jesus Christ. So I'm kind of excited about that. So with that, I'll just going to kind of transfer in, in John chapter 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
Adonai Elohim, and the word was and is God. So he was in the beginning with God. So if anybody doesn't think Jesus wasn't there at the time of creation, it's saying right here. So I'm kind of excited in, in, in some of these things. In verse, uh, in verse, in, in John chapter 1, verses 12 to 14, as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So the children of God, you have the right for continued life and resurrection life. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to breathe under any type of difficulty. Regardless of flood waters, I, I am the spring of living water that's going to bring you from a life from within. And it says, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You're born of God. So it's a, in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. We beheld his glory and the glory, you know, as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. So out there, you cannot sacrifice man's truth for man's peace. You cannot sacrifice man's truth for man's peace. You can only dwell in the peace of God and be in his glory as his glory carries in this time. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. You know, Bruce and Cheryl are going to come and bring us um, higher into that place of worship. And, and uh, just in, I'm, I'm using the Passion Translation in Revelation chapter 4. And this, it says, John's vision of the throne room. So then suddenly after I wrote down these messages, I saw a portal open in the heavenly realm. And the same trumpet voice I heard speaking with me at the beginning said, Ascend into this realm. I want to reveal to you what must happen after this. Mm. So there are things that had to happen after the floodwaters. Yes. Instantly I was taken into the spirit realm. And, and John, he uses that phrase, spirit realm, like, you know, about four times in through here. And behold, I saw a heavenly throne being set in place and someone seated upon it. God's throne is that governmental center of the universe. His appearance was like crystal, sparkling crystal, and glowing like a, a carnelian gemstone. Mm. I'm not sure I know what that is, but it's, it's a red color, according to the footnote here. It's a mineral red in color, and it's mm. glassy, translucent, um, and very semi-precious uh, gemstone. That the Latin word in there is cornum, and that's used for the cornal cherry, assuming to be cherry red, like the blood. So it's, you know, as we've mentioned, it's by the blood of the Lamb we can enter in to this place in heaven, into his glory, and to see him for who he really is and his mercy, obtaining mercy. Surrounding the throne was a circle of green light, like an emerald rainbow or a halo. Encircling the great throne were 24 thrones with elders in glistening white mm -hmm. garments seated upon them, each wearing a golden crown of victory. And pulsing from the throne, that means there's life there, pulsing, you know, a heart and the pulse, it's pulsing life and pulsing from the throne were blinding flashes of light, crashes of thunder and voices. And burning before the throne were seven blazing torches which represent 
the seven spirits of God. That sevenfold spirit of God. And in front of the throne there was pavement like a crystal sea of glass. And here comes the worship around the throne. Around the throne and on each side stood four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature resembled a lion, and the second an ox. The third had a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, full of eyes all around and under their wings. They worshipped without ceasing, day and night, singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the was, the is, and the coming. He is who was, who is, and is coming. And whenever the living creatures gave glory, honor, and thanks to the one who is enthroned and who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fell face down before the one seated on the throne, and they worshipped the one who lives forever and ever. And they surrendered their crowns before the throne, <coughs> singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and for your pleasure they were created and exist. And so <coughs> we were created as humans, as well as everything else that the Almighty created. for his pleasure. We exist and we are created <coughs> to give him glory and honor and praise. Shall we worship? We worship our king. Yes. In Israel right now, there's all kinds of issues. When you came in here this morning, you see all the red coverings over all the tables and so on. In Israel right now, it's all covered by the red flowers of the red anemone. Mm -hmm. It's like a Manitoba crocus Except comes red. up every spring, but it's a beautiful red flower showing the blood of the Lamb. Behold, the blood of the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. John one twenty nine, And Israel is all covered with it. It's all red. Isn't that a shadow and type Amen. of That's God's beautiful. mercy and grace? Blessings. Where would you like this one?
of our Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But, but, if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgments. So Cheryl and I were having a discussion actually on our way to Holy Spirit Science this morning, and Cheryl was talking about the altar, and how some Christians can feel like they can bring anything to the altar. They can bring their, their dirty rags, their, their sin, and their guilt. But you know what? When we go back to the Old Testament, as Cheryl was reminding me, it's the best that we bring to the altar. It's the best that we bring to the fire of God. We want to give Him our best. We don't want... Jesus already paid the price. He shed His blood. So we should already be in repentance before we come to the altar of God that we would bring our best offering to our Lord and Savior, our God, to that place of His altar. In the Old Testament, it was the best best that was brought to the altar. So let's bring our best today. Ask Holy Spirit to search your heart this morning before we take a communion.
23 and 24. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. God, we thank you, Lord. The ultimate sacrifice, God. Lord, you went to that cross. Lord, you hung on that cross, God. You took upon yourself all the sin, all my sin, all our sin, past, present, and future, Lord. You did it all, Lord. There is nothing that was not done and finished at the cross, God. So, Lord, in remembrance of you, God, we focus on your body, Lord. Lord, that took the lashes, that took the, the punishment, God, for all of our sins, Lord. You took it all upon that cross, God. Lord, to set us free, Lord. To redeem us from the curse, Lord, from the Garden of Eden, from Adam. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, we take this in remembrance of you.
I'll draw you forth to your destiny. 
Oh 
you know, there were, for those that didn't understand what was happening with the instruments, the instruments oh, were prophesying. Mm -hmm. It says, even the rocks will cry out. Mm -hmm. The instruments were prophesying. Mm -hmm. It was like uh, a radical amazement. Mm -hmm. An energized awe of God. Mm -hmm. What a, what a privilege it is to be in his presence. Mm -hmm. For even the angels in heaven to join in. Mm -hmm. I, I was hearing, I, I, hearing a, a multitude of sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, more than what's in this room. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was, it, this room was full and then it got fuller mm -hmm. and fuller. Energized all, the awe of God. To be in His presence. The heartbeat of God pounding, but at the same time, the warrior spirit, the bride, going forth with no fear of man, but the awe of God. That is what this time is all about. Noah had no fear of man, but an often reverent fear of his God. Many times it was silent wonder. He was getting downloads of how to draw the ark at a time that rain had never been on this earth. A silent wonder of awe of God with these schematics saying, get ready. Get ready. There's a flood coming. And get your family ready to build the ark. Regardless of what the world would do and mock you, they'll take your money. They'll take God's money. But you're going to build an ark of protection and safety for you. For all eternity. The ark of worship. Mm. Mm. You know the ark of the covenant. The ark of worship. What was in the ark? Authority was in the ark. Mm. Anointing nard was in the ark. A rod was in the ark and it said it will bloom. This stick, this, this, this rod will bloom on my next coming. And I'm coming back, says the Lord. It's in the ark. Along with the Torah. Precious things under the ark. What's in your ark? It's precious unto God, the holiness of the altar. Those things that we walk in covenant together and commitment of who we are in the body of Christ. It's not going to be easy as things get tougher, but it's going to be more beautiful in silent wonder in a radical amazement, in an energized awe of who we are and who the Lord is in the kingdom, as we are in the kingdom with Him. Wow, thank you. Thank you. You got anything, honey? Why don't you come up and receive the offer? Yeah, you yeah. Know, just take your time. Are you going to need a chair up here? Uh, yeah, I'll move the board, yeah. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll be, I, I'll move over here. And uh, Leslie will come up. Thanks. Energized awe. A radical amazement in his presence. Kingdom authority. Mm. A 
silent wonder. Sweetie. I really don't want to break this present. I really don't. And this is the greatest offering, is that he receives the offering of our praise. He receives the offering of our worship. And so, Lord, we present to you, even as it was already presented, mm -hmm. Lord, we present ourselves before you, God, and we lay, Lord, we lay ourselves at the throne and at the very feet of Jesus. And so, Lord, this is our offering before you. And we bless your holy name. Amen. Amen. Wow. We have, uh, as I say, spring is sprung and summer is sizzling. It's, it's good. It, we're just going into that season here in Canada and mid, Midwestern Canada, Keystone Province, and uh, to be in his presence. Uh, before Brock comes up and he's got a, uh, a teaching here that he's going to fill us up with. Um, just to mark your calendars, uh, July 12th, 13th, and 14th, we're having a powerhouse for youth here in Carberry. Uh, when I say powerhouse for youth, that's uh, we've uh, we, we've acquired the Carberry Fairgrounds for three days. Um, we've got some youth bands. One's called Excel from Brandon and, and two, actually two or three others, youth bands and we have youth speakers for th three days of uh, Jesus Crusade for youth in this area to reach out to the lost, reach out to the young people of this uh, area that are challenged with so many difficulties. So we're coming together uh, with the different churches in this area and in community and with Youth for Christ and... Uh, uh, and other church, churches partnering with us here and ministries uh, to reach out to youth. So that's happening in July. In August uh, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, we're actually having a gospel fest. And uh, for three days, you know, this is something I've been asking the Lord for, for that we'd be able to do a gospel fest. So um, I'm excited about that. It's going to be during the time of homecoming for this community, and the main street is going to be totally blocked off, and it's going to be filled with tents and different things. But uh, we've been, again acquired uh, the Carberry Fairgrounds, and uh, we'll be having uh, a gospel fest out there, and uh, we'll be worshiping the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and what's happening in the streets of Carberry may not be so much worshiping the the kingdom of God, but uh, they're going to be in the presence of God. And we're also going to be having a tent there that they've allowed us to put up. And in that tent, I said, can we do spiritual readings and give out books and literature and water? And they, and, uh, they said yes. And they said they'd even supply the tent. And they said, what spiritual readings? I said, well, it's uh, kind of like... Um, well, it's, it's like God speaking to them and telling them how much he loves them. And they said yes. So that's another breakthrough for this community. So we're going to have team members on that. So again, they're, it's, it's the kingdom of heaven invading earth in this area. So for this summer, we have two projects, and uh, one for youth, and then uh, because of the, you know, 
there's so many challenges here for youth, whether it be in Carberry or across Canada, to come against the discouragement, to come against, you know, mental, uh, you know, those difficulties for mental wellness and so on. So we're, we're going to be focusing on that, but from the kingdom of heaven invading the kingdom of this earth. So with that, um, bless you, bless you, bless you as Brock comes up. Is there anything else you need, Brock? You're good? You're good to go? Okay. Do you need this handheld thing? You're good? All right. I, I shall. And thank you for your, uh, your giving and your tithes and your offerings. Uh, as Leslie said, it, you know, this is the greatest offering that we can and come and worship him in spirit and in truth. So bless you for those supports that you give us here at Resurrection Life and also Holy Spirit Sands. Uh, bless you, bless you for your support. Thank you. Rock. Rock the rock. And your grace the rock. Father, thank you for meeting us in worship as we sung your praises and lifted up our, our voice and our instruments unto you. Please will you in like manner meet us as we open your word. Reveal your mind and your heart to us. And I pray by your spirit that you would give us comprehension of what the content of your mind and your heart is, that we may reflect your heart and your mind in our own hearts and minds, so that we may live obedient to you in our actions. In the authority of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Today is part two of the message we began last Sunday. Last Sunday we learned what God's favorite Bible verse and passage is, if our standard of measurement is the frequency with which he uses it. Does anybody remember what it is? Psalm 110 is God's favorite Bible verse and passage. By way of reminder, I'm going to read it again. It's a short psalm. If you'll turn with me to Psalm 110. I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. Psalm 110 of David. A psalm. Yahweh says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Have dominion in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely in the day of your power. In the splendor of holiness from the womb of the dawn, the dew of your youthfulness will be yours. Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings in the day of his anger. He will render justice among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will crush the head that is over the wide earth. 
he will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. This is a royal psalm. And it is the most quoted scripture from the Tanakh in the Berit HaDashah, the, the New Covenant, the New Testament as we know it. Uh, it is most quoted either by direct quotation or by allusion, making an indirect reference to it. And it seems to be an overarching theme or pattern in much of the apostles' preaching and teaching. And we can find a full exposition of it from the author of Hebrews. From Hebrews chapter 5 all the way to the end of chapter 10. Hebrews is a whole sermon recorded for us in the Bible. And there's five whole chapters that are dedicated to unpacking just a handful of verses from Psalm 110 and its significance. It's profound. About Jesus being our high priest and king and the necessity of his coming to die, to be a final sacrifice that is all satisfying to God, and that there's nothing to go back to for Jews. There's the, temp the temple doesn't have anything to offer. The old sacrifices, the way of slaughtering bulls and goats and lambs, doesn't have anything to offer now that the Messiah has come and fulfilled all of the things that those were simply pointing to as a shadow or a facsimile, a copy of heavenly realities. In meditating on this psalm, I found it odd, the end, verse, verse 7, he will drink from the brook by the wayside, therefore he will lift up his head. The, the, therefore it means to follow from, or a consequence of, in light of what just came before. It's a conclusion. He will drink from the brook by the wayside, therefore he will lift up his head. Doesn't that strike you as a little odd? <laughs> what does this mean? Well... I don't know if I have a definitive answer, but I did have an interesting thought. In Jude, pardon me, Judges, we'll start with J, my mind confused the two. Judges 7, 5 to 7, we see that passage of Gideon and his army going up against the enemies of Israel. I believe it was the Philistines there. Let's just go there so I don't confuse the details. Just go to Judges chapter 7. I'll just read Judges 1 to 7. Then Jerubal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose early and camped beside the spring of Harad. And the camp of Midian was on the north side of them, by the hill of Moriah in the valley. And Yahweh said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many. The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands, lest Israel honor themselves, saying, My own hand has saved me. So now come. Call out in the hearing of the people, say, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 remained. Then Yahweh said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And it will be that he of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But every one of whom I say to you, This one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and Yahweh said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set him aside by himself. And so also everyone who kneels to drink. Now the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to the mouth, was three hundred men, but all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. And Yahweh said to Gideon, I will save you with three hundred men who lapped, and will give the Midianites into your hands, so let all the other people go, each man to his place. So it went from 22,000 to 10,000 to 300. The first culling had to do with people didn't want to go to war at all, so they, they were the, the cowardly or the afraid, perhaps. They left and went down to 10,000, and the Lord brought them down to the water, and then he divided them based on how they drank water from the stream. So the ones that scooped it up with the hand and brought it to their head and lapped, they stayed. They were the ones that conquered the Midianites, and God gloried through them. And the others that knelt down and had their face right to the water and drank, they left. Why is that? 
Well, it could be that the ones who had their head right down to the water, they couldn't see what was all around them to the left and to the right. They were perhaps going to be easily struck unawares or taken off guard because they let their guard down in the way they drank. But the ones who scooped the water up and drank this way, they were having their head on the swivel, so to speak. So it speaks to alertness, observation, readiness, watchfulness, preparedness. So could it be that verse 7 of Psalm 110 He will drink from the brook by the wayside, therefore he will lift up his head, is indicative of his readiness, Amen. his position and posture for war, and his nobility as a king and priest. In that light, I think it makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. So remember, this is a royal psalm, speaking of the perpetual reign of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus makes a a riddle and a play on the content of this psalm when he's teaching in the the second temple in Jerusalem. And he puzzles the Pharisees and the scribes, the teachers of the law who are teaching in the temple, and and he pleased the, or perhaps amused the people that were listening to him, the, the common layperson, because They wanted to hear more. They hadn't heard this teaching before. And the question that he posed, David says to his Lord, sit at my right hand until I make a footstool for your feet. If the Messiah is the son of David, how does he say to him he's he's his Lord? Mm -hmm. A father doesn't say to his own son, you're my Lord. It would be the other way around in that day and age of anything. People had never heard that question before, and the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees were all caught off guard, and they dared not ask him the question, we learned. Whoa! Mindbuster. Yeah. (laughs) But we know now, after the Lord's ascended into, into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father, that Jesus was a son of David according to the flesh, and that he was a direct descendant by blood from him to his mother. But he is the Lord in that he's the uncreated, beginningless creator of the universe who added human nature to himself. He's always been God. He didn't become God. He's always been God. He became a man. So he added that human nature to himself. And, that, and the human nature that he added was from the, the line and descent of, of David. Thus fulfilling the prophecy. Now, you'll remember we read from the end of the Gospel of Luke and the end of the Gospel of John, and we talked a little bit about the different kinds of love and the play on words that was in the end of John with Peter and Jesus' uh, conversation. Now we're going to go back to Luke, and there's some things I want to point out. So, So the broad overview of the preaching this morning is we want to look at the content of Jesus' Bible study on the road to Emmaus. And we want, we're want going to look at the nature of Jesus' resurrection body. And in relation to that, what could explain the fact that he wasn't recognized right. on the road and by some of his disciples and even Mary at first when he was at the tomb, she mistook him for the gardener, which is, a, which is an interesting symbolic inclusion by the gospel writer that we could infer denotes him being the new keeper and planter of a garden in the, in the new Jerusalem. We, 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 could, we could read that in. We could, we, we could infer that. There is symbolic meaning there. But mistaking, Mary mistook him to be the gardener. She didn't, she didn't say the Lord initially. Very prophetic utterance. Yes, but the spirit, the spirit, spirit of God, when he, when he was inspiring the gospel writer, definitely put that there on purpose. No, there's no, there's no, there's no colon, semicolon, or period that's there by mistake. It's all there deliberately. So we have this prophetic picture of him being a gardener in one sense, but Mary actually thought he was a gardener. That's the, that's the most immediate meaning. So she didn't recognize him. Is what we're getting. At. It wasn't until he said her name 
that she recognized his voice. So why didn't she recognize him initially? Why didn't his disciples, the people that knew him, recognize him on the road to Emmaus? Some people posed preposterous theories of him being a shapeshifter or something. No. Or that he, he changed his physiology in, in, in some way, or that he veiled himself and, made the, and maybe altered their consciousness or their perception for a moment, and then he, and then he op- opened their eyes when he was able to disappear. I don't think that's the case either. There's no indication at all in the Gospels that he, pers- he, he hardened their hearts or altered their perception or their state of mind, whatever. They didn't recognize him. Why? Well, we'll touch on that. And then we're going to talk, talk, talk about the, the nature of the believer's resurrection body in relation to Jesus' resurrection body. So that will be the content of part two today. So going to the end of chapter Luke, if you'll turn with me there, we'll go to Luke 24, 27. Actually, we'll start in 25, 24, 25. And he, Jesus, said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So this was an approximate... 11 kilometer hike for them. They were going from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Jesus meets these disciples on that road. And for 11 kilometers about thereabouts, it says 60 stadia in verse 13, Jesus gives these guys a Bible study. Because they're foolish. By his own words. Interesting how there can be a play on how you use the word foolish, because Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, don't say to your brother, Raka, you fool, otherwise you'll, right. you'll incur judgment and be prone to the judgment of the hell of fire, he says, or the Gehenna, the garbage dump outside the city. Mm. That's what hell means there. There's Gehenna. It's the, it's the dump, literally. So you go to the Brandon landfill, <laughs> and you see the big pile of burning refuse. It was like that. That's Gehenna. <laughs> don't call your brother Raka in anger, you fool. But Jesus says, oh, you foolish ones here. So he's he's not rebuking them in anger. He's talking here about their their simple-mindedness or their their naivete or their their lack of knowledge here. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 26. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And then we go down to verse 44. There's an echoing of that as well. This is after Jesus appears to his disciples. He's, he's already had the bread with the guys on the road to Emmaus, breaks bread with them, then he vanishes from their sight. Then he appears to the disciples behind closed doors in the upper room where they had met for the Passover before, and then he says, peace to you. In verse 44, he says, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, all the things which were written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So in light of verse 27 and 24, this, this, the idea that the, it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and that all the things in the scriptures have to be fulfilled. What Jesus is saying is that the entire Old Testament is pointing to him. But I just, I just want to point out the, the noted divisions that Luke records here of the Old Testament as we know it. So that's where this diagram on the board is that come, comes in that I wrote down. So historically, the Jews understood the Old Testament. They didn't call it the Old Testament. They called it the the scriptures or the Tanakh. And you can think of it like an acronym. T stands for Torah, which means law or instruction or teaching. And then you have the Nevi'im. Whenever you see I am at the end of the Hebraic word, it's im, it's plural, the Nevi'im, the prophets. And then 
the K, the Ketuvim, it's the writings. Now, if you'll examine it, if you, just, if you just go turn to your Bible, if you have your printed Bible in front of you, turn to your table of contents and compare and contrast how the divisions are a little bit different. The Torah is still the same. We've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But you'll notice in the Nevi'im, we have Joshua, Judges, Samuel. got Samuel. So you notice there's not First and Second Samuel. Yeah, great. It's combined into one book. Kings is combined into one book. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the Twelve, which we call the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Not minor in terms of their importance, but it's an unfortunate moniker to refer to the length. So they're smaller prophetic books. So they were just called the Twelve. So that constitutes the prophets. And then the Ketuvim, the writings. We have the the wisdom and poetic literature. Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song, Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther. Daniel, interestingly enough, is a part of the Ketuvim, even though he's lastly considered to be a prophet. And he is. But it's nevertheless, because of the genre and style of writing of Daniel, he's included in the Ketuvim. It's one of the only books in the Bible that actually has Aramaic in it. We learned last week that the Bible is written in three languages over the course of virtually 1,600 years by over 40 different authors on three different continents. Those three languages are Hebrew, Aramaic, and Koine Greek. Daniel is written in Hebrew and Aramaic, and whenever the Gentile nations are addressed in his prophecies, the text transitions from Hebrew to Aramaic, which was a Gentile language, interestingly enough. And then we have Ezra and Nehemiah, which were combined together because of the content of the books pertaining to the restoration of the temple after it was destroyed the first time. Mm. And then we have the Chronicles. Chronicles was the last book in the Tanakh, not Malachi. Mm. Interesting. So when, when Jesus was mentioning once about the blood guiltiness of the, the Jewish Pharisaic later, leaders of, in Jerusalem, but how the blood of the prophets from I believe it says Moses all the way to the blood of, uh, what's his name? Son of Berechiah. I can't remember his first name. Anyway, oh, i got to look it up now. <laughs> he uses a figure of speech, essentially starting from the first prophet to the last prophet. And by doing that, he's spanning the entire um, length of the prophetic witness in the scriptures. I'm going to look it up right now. I have my digital Bible here. I don't have my concordance in front of me. Mm -hmm. This just came to me. Matthew 23, 35. I'll just go there quick. You can if you want. 23, 35. So he's, he's declaring these woes to the scribes and Pharisees, and at the end he says, So you bear witness against yourselves, so that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You're, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? On account of this, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you kill and crucify, and some of them you will flog in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of, blood of righteous Abel to, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. So he's going from Genesis 4 to the end of Chronicles because that execution of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, is at the end of Second Chronicles. So he's saying the end, from beginning to end, the blood guiltiness of every single righteous person is heaped up on you. Wow. That is heavy. So you, I'm just pointing out the figure of speech how Jesus will point to the, the first and the last to constitute the whole. So that's what he's doing in, in, in Luke here, when he's talking about the, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. The Psalms here is used as a 
synecdoche, which, which is a fancy word which means that one portion or part of a whole refers to the whole. So you'll notice in the Ketuvim, the Psalms is considered the first collection of books, or uh, the first collection of writings, or because Psalms is 150 poems yeah. in one book. So Jesus is using the first book of the Ketuvim to constitute the whole of the Ketuvim. So what he's saying is, from Genesis to Second Chronicles and everything in between, there was necessary requirements he had to fulfill. And that all of it, from beginning to end, is pointing to him. And this is where Christians historically have gotten this idea that Jesus is a fulfillment of all the things foretold in the Old Covenant. Not only there, but that's, that's a big place. You'll see Matthew always referring back to the prophet Isaiah. Jesus did this so that what the prophet Isaiah prophesied might be fulfilled, or the prophet Zechariah, etc. So the New Testament authors, especially the Gospel writers, are indicating this as you read when they quote the passage. But Jesus says himself explicitly, we don't know what Jesus taught on the road to Bimaeus for, those 11, for that 11 kilometer walk. We can only, we can only guess. It would be such a fascinating con uh, conversation to eavesdrop on, wouldn't it? I just figured it out. At two, point, at two to three kilometers per hour walking, that's a four hour walk with Jesus. Minimum. Minimum, yeah. Wouldn't that have been astonishing? <laughs> in, in his glorified body. So he's giving them this direct revelation, literally from the physical mouth of God, hmm. producing audible speech and sound right. to the ears of these two guys. Hmm. God is interpreting his own book, okay. his own collection of books to these guys. Hmm. They're getting infallible, unmistakable teaching right there. Wow. We can only guess what they, what they talked about. We could say maybe, maybe it was Isaiah 53, which we're very familiar with. It's on a banner here behind us. Peter's quoting, by his wounds you have been healed. That's not Peter's words. It's not new to Peter. He's quoting from Isaiah. Yeah. We, we, we could maybe say that. Maybe Psalm 22. You'll notice I listed five, uh, 25 ostensible, that is obvious, messianic psalms. If you want, write them down. Some big hallmarks there are Psalm 2, Psalm 22, and See, Psalm 110 there. So all those, not, not, not just those, but those in an obvious manner point to the Messiah and his accomplishments. Past and future. So don't ever listen to anybody. People like Andy Stanley who claim we have to, as Christians, unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. That is heresy. Yeah. No Christian ought ever divorce themselves from the Tanakh, for if we do, we have no New Testament. Yeah. As Augustine of Hippo rightly pointed out, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Yeah. 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 One contains the other. Yeah. Another way of saying it is the New Testament is the correct God-inspired interpretation of the Old Testament right. and the fulfillment thereof. And both are covenant. Amen. Both are covenant. If we cut ourselves off from the Tanakh because there's a bunch of weird things we can't understand, and people like Richard Dawkins say, your God's a barbaric ruffian because and, and, and an amoral... A uh, wicked being because, oh, he killed all the Canaanites and he, he went on all these military campaigns and killed women and children and men. Oh, that makes us uncomfortable. So, oh, let's just not touch that book. Yeah. Oh, there's all this bloodshed with the animal sacrifices. That's a little weird for me. Yeah. Let's, just, let's just leave that alone. Oh, women weren't treated that good in, in, those, in those stories. That makes me uncomfortable. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to leave that alone. We ought not discard the Tanakh, which points to the accomplishments, the finished work of Jesus the Messiah, 
because it offends our sensibilities in the modern time. Don't ever listen to anybody that would ever have you go in that direction. The Tanakh is God-breathed scripture. Jesus says so himself. Believe him. Believe the guy that prophesied his own death and rose himself from the dead. Believe him. And who sat down at the right hand of the power. Psalm 110. So, going to Luke 24 again, we're going to talk about the nature of the Lord's body now. I think there's some important things to to point out. It seems some Christians get confused on this. I'll just start from 36 and go to 43. So Luke 24, 36 to 43. Now, while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace to you. Think of shalom. But being startled and frightened, they were thinking that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me. And see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Amen. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were not believing because of their joy, they were still marveling. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? (laughs) Then Then they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it before them. Jesus had a corporeal, that is a genuinely, authentically physical vessel. He had blood. He had bones. He had sinews. He had organs. He was not merely spiritual. There's this idea that when we receive this resurrection body, it's just a spiritual body. It's not true. You will receive one day a body very much like the one you're currently occupying right now. And you'll be able to eat and drink the Lord's Supper with the Lord when he drinks the wine new in the kingdom at the wedding feast of the Lamb. You'll actually be able to drink physical liquid and eat physical food. (laughs) The difference is, the difference is, and this is the main difference between the body you're in right now and the body that you will receive is that it will be incorruptible. It will be without sin. It will be a body that will never have for a moment sinned invisibly or visibly, ever. You've never done anything wrong in that body. It'll be immaculate, perfect, and therefore immortal. It will not die. But you can still run. You can still walk. The things that you're accustomed to doing in your body, you'll be able to do but with, without ever sinning in it, and without having a past of sinning in that body, it'll be a brand new body. It'll be like the Lord's. Be amazing. It'll be a physical, corporeal body. And we'll recognize each other. How do I know that? Because it, for a little while, the disciples got to recognize the Lord. Mm-hmm. He still had features that were consistent with what he had prior to the crucifixion mm-hmm. that made him identifiable. So we'll be able to recognize each other. We still have our our physical, biometric characteristics that are individual to us. But we will not die. Ever. And that's exciting. Now, you'll see in in Jude, pardon me, I keep saying Jude. I don't know why. It's because I just preached a whole... I I, I just just preached on Jude a little while ago. Oh, yeah, we went through it all last time. Uh, John 2.15, I believe... No, that's not 2.15, I'm sorry. We we read the end of John. I made a typo in my notes. So when when Jesus is eating breakfast with the disciples at the end of John, John 21, 12 to 14, John 21, 12 to 14, Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to question him. Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. Now this is the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had finished breakfast, 
Jesus said to Simon Peter, and we already went through all that. Mm-hmm. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus included, he ate breakfast. Yeah, right. Spirits don't eat. Right. Spirits by nature and by necessity are non-physical. It's impossible for them to have physical contact with physical things, because by nature they're non-physical. Mm-hmm. So a spirit can't eat breakfast. So this is just corroborating what Luke records also. The Lord has a physical body. And what's cause for excitement, especially for me, is the promise in Romans chapter 6. If you'll turn there with me. Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been justified from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts, its wrongful desires." And do not go on presenting your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness for God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we certainly shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So if Jesus was able to be touched and seen, could eat and drink, had flesh and bone, as he said he did in Luke, if he could eat breakfast like like John tells us he did, so also with us. Mm. For we are, if we are in union with him in his death, we'll be in union with him in his life, in his resurrection. Amen. Our resurrection is not merely spiritual. The spiritual resurrection occurs when you're born again, when you're made a new creation, and the Spirit gives you new birth. Through the the coming of the Spirit into you, symbolized by baptism, we're resurrected in the Spirit, invisibly in this life. And then after the Lord has sanctified us, purified us, conformed us to His image invisibly, And so through our actions and our mind and our desires, to match, he'll give us a body after that process. We have so much to look forward to. This is corroborated also in Philippians 3.15-17, which is somewhat of a motto around here. I'm preaching to the choir, as it were, but... Bringing this one up, but just for just for fun, I'll I'll point to it. Yeah. Philippians three fifteen. Let us therefore, as many who as are perfect, think this way. Oh, forgive me. I'm going to back up. I missed the spot. Okay, I'm just going to start in verse 3. Classic rock, right? Start at the beginning, right? 
<laughs> okay. Philippians chapter 3. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God upon faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I presently have, obta have obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Adelphoi, siblings, brothers, sisters, I do not consider myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, think this way, or mature. Therefore, let any of us, as many as are perfect or mature or complete, think this way. And if in anything you think differently, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep walking in step with the same standard to which we have attained. Brothers, join in, a, in following my example and look for those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often have told you and now even tell you by crying as enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their stomach, and glory is for, ends in their shame, and have set their thoughts on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state in the, into the conformity with the body of His glory, by His working through which He is able even to subject all things to Himself. He says, so those of us who are mature think of the resurrection as the goal, the prize, the inheritance. That's what we're aiming for. The resurrection, that the new body. Because when we have that new body, it doesn't matter if we're in the cosmos, in the heavens. It doesn't matter if we're on earth. It doesn't matter if we're under the earth or if we're someplace in between. We'll be with the Lord. Amen. And we're never going to die. Amen. And we'll have new bodies that are never going to be sinned in. Mm -hmm. Ever. <laughs> and our minds will be opened to comprehend and view the glory of the Lord and His fullness. And we will not die. Imagine that. Seeing the apex of anything that can be absorbed by the senses. Beholding the glory of God. And your body can withstand the intensity yes, yes. and not be fried to a crisp. Yes, yes. <laughs> if we did it now, we would be annihilated. Not our spirits, but our bodies. Amen. But we won't have to worry about that one day. Now, I want to read, just to, to continue unpacking this a little bit more with the words of Scripture, because I think it's, it's really clear. Go to 1 Corinthians, and then we'll talk a little bit more about our, the nature of our, our new bodies. And then we'll talk about that one other part I wanted to mention about why disciples 
couldn't at first recognize the Lord and what that possibly might point to. And then we'll close. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to read 13, and then we're going to read half of verse 15. I'm skipping the part at 14 and the beginning of 15 for brevity's sake. And it could be a whole other message unto itself. 1 Corinthians, what? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the excellence of love. We're going to okay. look at that, and then we're going to look at the latter half of chapter 15 in 1 Corinthians, which talks about the nature of our new bodies. So 1 Corinthians 13. So important to be reminded of this. This is the biblical definition of love. This is agape love, the highest order of love. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge... And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love, agape, is patient. Agape is kind. Is not jealous. Does not brag is not puffed up, it does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, it does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Agape never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy... They will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will full but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now abide faith, hope, agape, love, these three. But the greatest of these is agape love. Let's turn the page to Chapter 15, verse 35. But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool! That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that what you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wishes, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, and another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthy bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthy is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a corruptible body. It is raised an incorruptible body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. But don't read into it what we've already talked about. It's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, he, and the first man Adam, became a living soul. And the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. 
However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the corruptible inherit the incorruptible. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible must put on the incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible puts on the incorruptible, and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the word that is written, quote, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Close quote. Now the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Some have mistakenly taken this passage and just read that in verse 44 that natural body is raised a spiritual body and they'll run with that and they'll make a sermon out of it saying that our bodies are spiritual. But we have to take the whole witness of Scripture into account when unpacking these things. And we already clearly saw Jesus said he had flesh and bone and he ate. He was able to be touched and seen. And he said spirits aren't like that, he said. So how do we reconcile what we see in the Gospels and what we see here with Paul preaching? Well, I think this, the confusion is done away with when we recognize that when he's talking about the earthy not being able to put on the, the heavenly, the corruptible can't put on the incorruptible, he's talking about the fallen sin bodies that we currently inhabit can't carry on to inherit immortality. It's got to die. That's what he's talking about. And the spiritual body that we have, this is, this is what I'm talking, what we were talking about earlier, about the first step in our resurrection process. We're made a new creation by giving, we're, we're getting new hearts. First, the heart of stone that was in us is given and replaced for a heart of flesh. We want to love what God loves and we hate what God hates. We want to be conformed to his image and, and, and imitate his character. Learn to obey him in our invisible person. So we're, we, we gain that invisible body in that sense. But we were designed as physical and spiritual beings together. That's why scripture uses the euphemism of being naked when, we're, when the spirit's away from the body. Because we're meant to be clothed with flesh. That's the way God designed Adam. So we are conformed to the image of Jesus in his death and in his life, invisibly in this life. And we know from Hebrews it's appointed once for every man and woman to die. And then comes life. Unending. And to, be, to die is to be in the presence of the Lord, we're told. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And there's going to be a time where some of us will be on disembodied spirit before the throne of God, perhaps under the altar of God, it was as we read about in Revelation, that they're offering petitions and prayers as incense unto the Lord. Because they're still waiting for their bodies, and they're asking, how long, O Lord? Mm. Not how long only for their, waiting for their body, but how long until those who commit injustice and wickedness and lawlessness in the earth are going to be judged. And then when that time has passed, when the fullness of the scriptures has been fulfilled in time, then... There's that moment when the Lord returns. And as soon as he returns, that is the moment we all get our new bodies. The rapture is the resurrection from the dead. They're synonymous. That word rapture comes from Latin, Vulgate actually, which came from the Greek word in Thessalonians, harpazo. Harpazo means to be caught up. The word rapture is not used 
in the Greek or in the English typically, unless you're reading the King James. But that, that word that's, that was translated rapture came from the Latin Vulgate. That's how they rendered it. But the, lag, the, the Vulgate was getting it from the underlying text, the Greek, harpazo, to be caught up. That's what it means, to, to meet the Lord in the air. And when you go to that scripture, Paul says, there's going to be some that are left on the earth before the Lord comes back. And then those who are in the dust or in the graves, they rise first to meet the Lord in the air. They harpazo him in the air. And then those of us who are left are changed an instant. We go meet them. Mm-hmm. So that's that twinkling of an eye that, ch- that we're changed in a moment. Mm-hmm. In, a, in, a, in a twinkle of an eye. Just like, you know, faster than that. Just, oh, Bruce! Bruce! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I recognize yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> what an exciting day that will be. Okay, now we'll we'll come to the close. We'll just talk in brief about Jesus not being recognized. Mm-hmm. Brother William, when he preached a couple weeks ago, pointed out that it could have been that when Moses was in the cleft of the rock and saw Yahweh passing before him, proclaiming his glory and his name before him, and he only saw his back, that he may have saw his Jesus striped, scarified back. That could be. Could be. Very likely, in fact. We're not told explicitly, but that could be. So, why wasn't the Lord recognized? Well, Let's go to Isaiah, chapter 50. See, it's interesting. When, when, when one recognizes that the New Testament is concealed in the Old, and the Old is revealed in the New, sometimes we get a lot more color and detail about certain realities that are only hinted at in the New Testament, or sometimes presuppose a certain understanding or knowledge from the reader. That's often the case, is that the New Testament writers assume you already know certain things. And that knowledge comes from the Tanakh. There was an expectation for the Messiah, and there was a familiarity with these things that he had to do, and what he would suffer, and that kind of thing. So this was one such passage about some of the specificity of what the Messiah would have to go through. So we'll start in Isaiah 50, verse 4. And we're going to read to 53.12. Before I do, I just wanted to share this. I just had this thought. It just came back to me. I already had it, but it just came back to me. Uh, It's interesting that we're never given the physical description of Jesus in the Bible. We're not, we, don't, we don't know what his hair color is or his eye color is. We don't know how tall he was. We don't know what color of skin he had. Right. Because it didn't matter. His physical appearance did not matter because it's the person himself. His mind, his heart, his soul, his character. The very nature of his being. His identity that was what mattered, not his physical appearance. Right. Otherwise, humans often just, they, 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 they fixate on the external. And Jesus said that people that focus on the external and the outside, they, they, they judge wrongly. We're to judge with right judgment. And that means not looking at the outward appearance. So with that, with that thought in mind, Isaiah 50, verse 4. Lord Yahweh has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a sword with a word pardon me I'll read that again Lord Yahweh has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word He awakens me morning by morning He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple Lord Yahweh has opened my ear and I did not rebel nor did I turn back I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not hide my face from dishonor and spitting. Even now, Lord Yahweh helps me. Therefore, I am not dishonored. 
Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up to each other. Who has a judgment against me? Let him approach me. Behold, Lord Yahweh helps me. Who is he who condemns me? Behold, they will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. Who is among you that fears Yahweh, that listens to the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of Yahweh and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who gird yourselves with firebrands, walk in the light of your fire, and among the brands you have set ablaze. This you will have from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Let's just pause there for a moment. As Isaiah is recording this, he's recording the, the, the first person monologue, dialogue of the Messiah. It's the Messiah speaking in the first person. I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not hide my face from dishonor and spitting. I have set my face like flint. What's flint used for? Fire. Striking. What, what, what's yeah. Flint is a brittle rock that is chipped. It's like shale almost. Yeah. And when you, the more you chip it, the more chunks break off of it. Yeah, it, breaks, it brings sparks, but it, it gets worn down. But the chunks are sharp. The char yeah, chunks are sharp. And, yeah, it does cause sparks and fire. That's what you use a flint for. But the, the, the image here is being given up his face like a flint. He's, he's being chipped away at. Yeah. Could it be? See, the Lord says he's, he he's, did not hide his face from dishonor and spitting. Did not hide his cheeks from those who pluck out the beard. When the Lord was being abused by the temple guard, could he have been so disfigured that it resulted in permanent scarring on his face? Let's keep going. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, who seek Yahweh. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who brought you forth through labor pains. When he was but one, I called him, and I blessed him and multiplied him. Indeed, Yahweh will comfort Zion. He will comfort her in all her waste places. And her wilderness, he will make like Eden and her desert like the garden of Yahweh. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and sound of melody. Pay attention to me, O my people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For a law will go forth from me, and I will set my justice for a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will hope in me, for my arm they will wait expectantly. Lift up your eyes to the sky, then look to the earth beneath, for the sky will vanish like smoke, and the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not be dismayed. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, a people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat them like a garment, and the grub will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Awake! Awake, put on strength, O arm of Yahweh. Awake as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who chopped Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea? The waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over, so the ransomed of Yahweh will return and come with a joyful shouting to Zion, and everlasting gladness will be on their heads. Then they will obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing will flee away. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies and the son of man who is made like grass? For you have forgotten Yahweh, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, that you tremble and dread continually all the day because of the wrath of the one who brings distress as he makes ready to bring ruin. 
But where is the wrath of the one who brings distress? The one in chains will soon be set free and will not die in the pit, nor will his bread be lacking. For I am Yahweh your God who stirs up the sea and its waves roar. Yahweh of hosts is his name. I have put my words in your mouth and have covered you with the shadow of my hand to establish the heavens, to found the earth and to say to Zion, you are my people. Awaken yourself, awaken yourself, arise, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of Yahweh the cup of his wrath, the chalice of reeling you have drained to the dregs. There is none to guide her among all the sons she has borne, nor is there one to take hold of her by the hand among all the sons she has reared. These two things have befallen you. Who will console you? The devastation and destruction, famine and sword, how shall I comfort you? The sons have fainted. They lie helpless at the head of every street, like an antelope in a net, full of the wrath of Yahweh, the rebuke of your God. Therefore now listen to this, you afflicted, who are drunk but not with wine. Thus says your Lord, Yahweh, even your God, who contends for his people. Behold, I have taken out of your hand the cup of reeling, the chalice of my wrath. You will never drink it again. I will set it into the hand of those who cause you grief, who have said to you, Lie down, that we may walk over you. You have even set your back down like ground and like the street for those who walk over it. Awake! Awake! Clothe yourselves in strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in glorious garments, O Jerusalem and the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer come into you. Shake yourself from the dust. Rise up, O captive Jerusalem. Loosen yourself from the chains around your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says Yahweh, you were sold for nothing and you will be redeemed without money. For thus says Lord Yahweh, my people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, then the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. So now what do I have here, declares Yahweh, since my people have been taken away for nothing? Yahweh declares, those who rule over them howl, and my name is continually blasphemed all day long. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore in that day I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who proclaims good news, who announces peace and proclaims good news of good things, who announces salvation, says to Zion, Your God reigns! The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voices. They shout joyfully together. for the, They will see with their own eyes when Yahweh returns to Zion. Break forth, shout joyfully together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For Yahweh has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Yahweh has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there, touch nothing unclean. Go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who carry the vessels of Yahweh. But you will not go out in haste, nor will you go as those who flee. But Yahweh will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were appalled at you, my people. So his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them they will see. And what they had not heard they will understand. Pause there. Before we go on to what we all know very well. His appearance was so marred. More than any man. And his form more than the sons of men. Could it be? that our Lord in his resurrected body looked different than he did before he was crucified because he was beaten to an mm. unrecognizable pulp. Mm. He gave his cheek to the plucking out of the beard, ripping out hair by the follicle, out of the flesh in the cheek, given like flint to be struck. Mm. It seems our resurrection, and this, I wanted to say this for last, when our when we receive our resurrection bodies, we'll be like the Lord in another way, I believe. Mm. We'll have our scars. An interesting if we're beheaded for Christ, will we have a collar around our neck in the resurrection, glorifying Christ by the death we died? Mm. If we're burned alive, will we look like a raisin? 
to glorify Christ in the death we died. If we were beaten with rods, will we have those stripes on our back? Will we see Paul in his glorified body with all of those stripes he received? Three times the 40 lashes less one. Will we see Peter with holes in his hands? For he was crucified upside down. We are to share with Christ in his sufferings and in his death so that we may share in his resurrection. And we glorify Christ in our death. Fifty-three. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor the appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and one like from whom men hide their face. And he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our peace fell upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. But oppression and judgment, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, that for the transgression of my people, striking was due to him. So his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would place his soul as a guilt offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh will succeed in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide for him a portion with the many, and he will divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. So what if, when we go to see Jesus face to face, the one whom we love with all of our being, the creator, our maker, and we see him, and it's not what we expect. And he doesn't have the standards of human beauty in his face. What if we see a face asymmetrical, mm. scarred from being struck like flint, mm. scarred from his beard being plucked out, from being so marred beyond comprehension and being disfigured that there's evidence of that? Will we still love him because he looks like that? sure hope so. With that in mind, let's go to John, the end of John again. Perhaps with this knowledge in mind, this might make a little more sense. I'll just read John 21 to 1 to 14, and then, we'll, and then that, well, I'm done. After these things, Jesus manifests himself to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifests himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, We will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when... But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Keep in mind, they already saw him twice. 
So Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garments on, for he was stripped for work, and cast himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about two hundred cubits away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got on the land, they saw charcoal fire in place, and fish placed on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land, full of large fish, 153, and all together there were so many the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Tell them have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to question him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. See what? I'm convinced that in this life we'll get to know the Lord so well those of us who love him it doesn't matter what he looks like <laughs> and we would dare never say who are you for we already know him right. even though we have not seen him and what did he say blessed are those mm -hmm. who have not seen and yet believe right. may we be counted amongst that number mm -hmm. thank you for your attention Ray, do you have anything else to say? Or want me to close it out? Yeah. Uh, just, no, I think. Thank you, Brock. Uh, thank you, Brock. Oh, I know. There is such an anointing. There's such a wonderful thing that we've had through worship, through prophetic utterance. But in the worship, it was all about the glory of God, His glory. Um, and then in your teaching today, um, what is the question? In Philippians 3.10, it says that you know Him Amen. and the power of His resurrection also. We also had in the fellowship of the suffering, which is uh, Passover communion, that we, we come in and we have that fellowship of the understanding of everything that you described Amen. from, you know, mm -hmm. from the resurrection to the ascension. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the one question we don't have is, who are you? <laughs> right. I hope the one question that you do not have is, who are you? If you're still trying to figure out who Jesus is, who the Father is, who the Holy Spirit is, He's speaking to you and saying, I am agape. I am the unconditional love that you're searching for. Don't push me away. I'm the unmeasured acceptance that is pursuing you. That word, you know, that you were talking about as far as perfect in the Hebrew or Greek is etonie, which means in the pursuit of holiness. In other words, you're not quite there. We're always in the pursuit of that perfection of holiness. We need to be in that place of always in the per pursuit of the perfection. We are in the pursuit. We've been accepted, but we need to pursue the holiness and the altar and the glory. And the unconditional forgiveness based on everything that you've been teaching the last two weeks, everything that comes from this pulpit, everything that comes from the worship, the altar, or from the heart, is the unconditional forgiveness that comes through the blood and the surrender. When we come to that place and say that... <laughs> that say that Jesus is and always will be our Savior. Not who are you? 
but you are, you are, and the I am is, and the Holy Spirit is within you, the promise. So the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Oh, the Lord be gracious to you, just as we talked about in Noah, you know, like in Genesis chapter 6. God is gracious during difficult times. He says, this is my grace, this is my mercy right now. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you every morning. And the Lord give thee peace, shalom. Because where there is peace, there is no chaos. And that you know him in every one of his ways. That you know him. He really wants to know you, that you become one. So until next week, the Lord bless you again. Lord bless you. Lord bless you. We love you. Until we see you next week.